so hello everyone once again i hope my screen is very clearly visible please give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if not is it visible am i clearly audible everything going smooth yes yes okay saksham all right all right so guys i'll just begin by introducing myself although most of you already know me but there are uh, a few students who would be watching this video later on so my name is sarvesh mokkar i passed out my chartered accountancy way back in 2009 and uh, i have worked extensively in various sectors of the finance industry i started off with of course the taxation and the audit industry uh, my entire internship articleship was uh, into auditing the manufacturing sector and in those days it was the indian gap that was in uh, in full flow it was it was followed across the industry so indian gap is nothing but uh, the 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 accounting standards that we know of okay these days most of the corporates the big companies they follow uh, something called division 2 of schedule 3 okay now this is not important for you as acca students but just uh, to relate the concept in india we have something called schedule 3 schedule 3 to the companies act uh, and schedule 3 to the companies act have two divisions division a and division uh, division 1 and division 2 division roman 1 division roman 2 so in division roman 2 they have given formats so whatever we are going to learn under ias 1 international accounting standard 1 okay is a, is uh, similar to what we have in division 2 schedule 3 now the reason i am sharing these things with you is you should also know what is happening uh, parallelly in in our country okay we are of course studying ifrs but you should also know how ifrs has been adopted uh, in india so uh, when i started off when i was doing my uh, article ship in uh, one of the mid sized audit firms we used to follow uh, division 2 schedule 3 and we had the indian gap we did not have ifrs we did not have uh, even the ind as which is uh, followed these days so uh, most of my internship experience i had uh, you know I, i had the experience of implementing the 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 old indian accounting standards the indian gap later on when i cleared my ca i worked uh, with a pune based company for two years it was an equity research and valuation firm i switched over from audit to equity research and during this entire period all this while i was very active into trainings in fact i started teaching way back when i was i guess only 20 years old uh, i started teaching uh, you know the the plus 2 students the 12th grade students uh, i started teaching accounting economics for 12th standard and then later on for uh, for graduation papers the first year second year third year bcom and then when i cleared my ca when i joined uh, you know last one year it was into audit industry and then i switched over to uh, the valuations and equity research and in those days ifrs was just picking up picking up it was 2009 10 yeah it was 2010 and when uh, <clears throat> you know uh, various countries across the world they decided you know one they had their uh, um their understanding that let's let's have one global accounting standard okay enough of this you know us having its own accounting standard uk having its own standard india having its own standard uh, because of that you know each country is having different accounting standards uh, investments uh, was becoming very difficult you know global investments were becoming very difficult i remember one example when uh, you know infosys you all of us all of you know infosys right it's it's one of the biggest it firms it companies in india it was looking for uh, a listing in the us stock market okay so the us uh, as we all know they are very adamant they are they are uh, they, they worship their own accounting standards like anything they believe that us gap is the best in the world 
so Infosys, in order to obtain listing on the US market, uh, on the US stock exchanges, had to convert its entire uh, financial statements uh, into, U in, into US GAAP compliant, which was a humongous task and, and very, very expensive. So this is only one example I'm sharing with you. Many companies began to face uh, this problem. You know, it was it was becoming very tedious, very expensive to convert all your financial statements into uh, the accounting standards of the country where you are looking to invest. So if you want to if you are to invest in US, you have to again restate your financial statements into uh, which are US GAAP compliant. If you want to invest in Australia, you want to again restate your entire balance sheet into uh, the Australian accounting standards. Now, this was becoming very tedious. It was becoming, uh, you know, very difficult to, to really invest in other countries. And, and, you know, by that time, globalization was in full flow and the capital had to really transfer very smoothly and very swiftly. So these accounting, uh, uh, you know, compulsions, these accounting regulations were creating a lot of difficulty towards that. And then, you know, one fine day, these 150, 160 countries decided to, not one fine day, it happened over a period of time, but just, you know, I'm saying it that one fine day, they all decided, come on, let's have one global accounting standard. And that was the beginning. It was around 2010. The process started way back in 2000, uh, 2002, but uh, for eight years, there was not much of, you know, any movement towards that, any actions towards that. But from 2010, uh, IFRS really begin, began to penetrate into, uh, into the industry. So I have seen, uh, you know, that entire cycle from when nobody in India knew about IFRS. I have worked in IFRS trainings during those days when none of the people, none of the industry people in India were even aware that there is something called IFRS. So I've seen that journey from 2010 and uh, today it is 2000. 22. Okay, it has been a long journey and IFRS has really evolved very well. Okay, so uh, this was my experience in the audit and financial reporting since 2011. I have been training the corporates. Uh, I've been also uh, associated with a few firms in, in, my, uh, in my city, that is Pune, uh, which, is, which are very active into IFRS implementation and consulting. Uh, so far as trainings are concerned, I am currently actively associated with uh, the firms that I've mentioned, and I provide financial management, financial reporting, uh, SBR, and FR, of course, anything related to IFRS, uh, and of course, financial management, which uh, some of you have already attended. Now, in the past, I have worked with a few uh, internationally reputed companies, publishing companies like uh, the Get Through Guides, GTG. And uh, I've also worked with the ISDC group. I provide trainings in IFRS, financial management, and of course, uh, the derivatives have has been my, uh, my passion really, so far as trainings are concerned. And I also like to travel a lot. I, I write journals, I write a lot of articles. And one of my missions is to really see people uh, becoming more financially literate because over the past uh, 15 years of my experience in the finance sector and and with the, and working with people across you know on the personal finance front and also the corporate finance front i've seen that there is a huge uh, you know uh, 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 what should I, what should i say an apathy towards finance education people really need to uh, upgrade themselves in terms of financial knowledge and uh, that would really help them to you know towards their overall self development and to live an optimal life so guys this is a little bit about me now what i'm going to do is the agenda for today this is our introductory session the first session for strategic business reporting and also i i have come to know that some of you are or rather all of you are out of touch with the concept of IFRS with, with financial reporting paper. So I'm not going to rush up today. My agenda is to first introduce you to the syllabus, what exactly is expected in this paper. 
So we are going to take a look at the topics that we are going to learn. We are going to take a look at the question paper format. And most importantly, we are also going to uh, start with, you know, brushing up the basics. Like the, the most important thing I have realized is to have a sound understanding of the conceptual framework. Okay, now what is conceptual framework of IFRS? We are going to, I'm going to do my best to explain it to you in the easiest possible way. And by, you know, as, as you, some of you already know, I give a lot of practical and real life examples. So uh, that is what I'm going to follow for SBR as well. So guys, let me take a pause here to check with you. Am I audible? Am I understood? Is the speed okay? You can answer in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, Ishika, please feel free to respond. Uh, rest of the students already know me. So I keep my sessions very student friendly. You are more than welcome to interact with me. I like to keep my sessions very, very interactive. So, and don't worry about giving right answers. Okay. Don't get into the trap of right and wrong at this stage, because at this stage, all of you are learning. Okay. So don't worry about giving the right answer. Okay. But I want you to just set up your thought process. Okay. Your thought process has to be developed over a period of time. Automatically, you know, all of your answers will be correct. Okay, so don't worry about right and wrong. So do respond whenever I ask you any questions. Okay, so yes, okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so thank you guys for responding. Now, I generally start off IFRS sessions by asking a simple question, especially to those students who have some background in financial reporting, who knows a little bit about IFRS. So guys, let me ask you all, why are we studying this paper? Why are we studying this subject? What is the intent behind studying IFRS? And I want simple, crisp answers. Let us all assume that we are all, you know, lay people. Okay, of course, we have some background in accounting, but I don't want very fancy answers. I want simple, straightforward, whatever you can share. Why do you think we need IFRS? International Financial Reporting Standards. So why do we need to learn this? So we are soon going to be a part of the accountancy profession. We are going to be professional accountants. So why do we need to know IFRS? Or rather the question is, why are IFRS required at all? You can unmute yourself to answer or you can answer in the chat. to understand the general framework according to which the financial reports of a company are supposed to be prepared very good it, it gives us a sound framework it's a very good answer yes anybody else anyone would like to try as i said don't worry about right right and wrong at this stage but whatever you think you can just shoot. Ishika, you would like to answer? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so, please. Yeah. Sir, like to prepare the financial statement according to the standards so that we can prepare the statement. Yeah, exactly. But why do we need these standards? To maintain the con consistency over the globe okay to maintain consistency to maintain comparability very good good now all of your answers are correct but i am going to go a little deeper today okay generally i share these things with my financial reporting students my fr students but yes it's going to help you throughout it's going to help you in SBR as well. Okay, Vedic says in the chat, common rules so that financial statements can be consistent and comparable around the world. Very good, very good. But my dear students, I'll tell you something very important. The answers that you gave me are correct, but they are of tertiary importance. You know what is the meaning of tertiary importance? Tertiary importance is like 
if i just give you a uh, you know a metaphor or an analogy and i'm going to i give lot of analogies okay so my old students already know lot some of them are really funny <laughs> so i'll give you a metaphor if i if i order lunch okay i i go to a restaurant and i i order lunch okay and that lunch is uh, let us say what we what we call in india you know a thali okay a rice plate or thali whatever we call where we have multiple dishes we have rice we have roti and all that stuff so one part of it is maybe uh, some sweet dish or maybe pickles so the answers that you have given me are correct but they are like a small part of the entire serving okay it's like a pickle it's or it's like a sweet dish that we have at the end but we have right now completely missed out on the main chunk of food and that is what we are going to discuss now so i'll give you a practical example and then you tell me whether you understand it let us say i am an investor i have some surplus funds and i want to invest i have decided to invest in let us say automobile sector okay i want to buy shares of a company a good company in the automobile industry now what are some companies that you already know from the automobile industry the two most popular ones let us say the tata group all of all of you know tata group and the second one let us say the mahindra group and let us say i have 1 million dollars to invest so i am a high net worth individual i am a high net worth investor so big money is at stake i want to choose i don't want to invest in both i want to pick one i want to concentrate my portfolio i want to concentrate my investment i want to pick either tata or mahindra okay so what am i supposed to do i am supposed to examine their financial statements yes or no agreed the first step that i am going to do okay as a as an investor i am going to really analyze their financial statements of course i am going to talk to their management and i am going to see many other things but principally i am going to focus on the annual reports the financial statements the public documents now if i tell you that this is the balance sheet okay i'm just drawing a raw balance sheet a t shaped one this is not ifrs compliant balance sheet this is an analytical balance sheet okay so this is just t shaped and the left side is liabilities the right side is assets okay now all of us know that big companies big manufacturing companies has a, have a huge investment in non current assets you know which we call as fixed assets right so tata company mahindra company they have huge investments in non current assets now let us say tata motors or uh, and mahindra and mahindra group have a particular x amount of investment in the non current assets non current assets property plant equipment etc and we very well know that we have to charge something called depreciation on these non current assets is there anyone in this class right now who does not know anything about depreciation is there anyone are you all aware of the term depreciation so depreciation is an expense which is charged to the pnl account it's an expense it's a charge so guys i am trying to give you a very simple example to convince you why ifrs is required okay i'm just picking up the knowledge that you already have i can give you very fan fancy examples but that won't serve you so i'm giving you very simple examples based on the knowledge you already have so tata and mahindra has some x amount invested in nca and we know that a part of it will be charged as depreciation and what is the ultimate outcome of the pnl my dear students can you tell me what is the ultimate outcome why do we prepare pnl we prepare to find the performance whether the particular company is generating a profit or whether it is incurring a loss so basically we are interested in the performance i i would be as an investor interested to know the performance of the tata group and the mahindra group so basically i want to know whether they are creating some value for the investors 
which is profit or whether they are deleting value for the investors now don't you think that the amount that will be recognized as nca is extremely important why is it extremely important i will refer ias 16 okay don't worry if you are not able to recollect but i i think uh, there must be some memory you have about ias 16 ias 16 is an accounting standard which focuses on property plant and equipment now when we had studied ppe in financial reporting the first thing that we studied was how to find the cost of the nca don't you think so this was this was the simplest thing the first thing that we studied so cost of the nca that means at what amount should this nca be recognized in the balance sheet what amount should this x be that is what is called as determining the cost so what are those items there are several items that we are supposed to add and this standard gave very clear guidelines as to what those amount should be like purchase price plus all the taxes which are non refundable they are to be added plus any octroi that you pay that has to be added plus all those expenses now i hope you are able to recollect you have some faint memory maybe all those expenses which are incurred by the company to bring this asset into the factory and make it operating make it operational all those expenses that are incurred to bring the asset to its existing location that is the factory and to make it operational all those expenses are also are to be added into the cost now one of the expenses i can clearly remember was wages now my dear students these wages are different from the wages which are paid to the workers for producing the output what are these wages for then these wages are paid to those workers those people who are working towards setting up this plant and machinery installing this plant and machinery so some workers will be dedicated for some time to to install that plant and machinery the plant and machinery is not yet ready for production but these people are working very hard to install it and they have been paid their wages normally we all know that employee cost like salaries wages etc are debited to pnl but i 16 clearly says no if you are paying money to people who are working towards setting up a plant in your factory you need to add their wages to the cost of that plant you are not supposed to debit it to pnl you are supposed to capitalize it this is what is 16 says now the question was the question was why do we need ifrs okay that was the foundation question that we all uh, that we started off with. if this guidance wasn't there if there was no one to tell us that these expenses these wages these octroi are to be added to the cost what would have individual companies what would they have done now tata would have for example okay these are just for example sake i'm taking names tata would have shown these wages as an expense in the pnl because they believe that they are wages right they are they are the salaries the wages the employee costs and they are always to be debited they are to be charged to the pnl very true mahindra would have used another logic they would have said no these are the wages not towards production of any output but towards setting up of the plant so we are going to add it into the nca so first and the foremost both tata and mahindra would have used their individual logics their individual approach their individual thought process to recognize these expenses guys are you with me are you understanding this so there would have been a discrepancy in the approach between two companies of the same sector are you all understanding just tell me yes no if there was no guidelines this would have happened okay now this answers 
this is an example to what you said most students give me the answer that there should be comparability consistency so this was the example for that but i want to share something deeper okay now you'd be very careful if there was no guidelines if there were no ifrs always ask this question throughout your syllabus you have to stay with this question if this standard was not there what would have gone wrong okay this is the question you have to always ask yourself whenever you are studying ifrs so if there was no ifrs no framework nothing what i would have done you know i would have seen okay it's always the manipulative mind of human beings right so humans like to always uh, you know they are driven by fear and greed so i would have seen let us say i work for tata motors i am an accountant of tata motors or i am the you know the manager of tata motors so i know that in the coming year tata is looking for my company is looking for attracting new investments i want more people other companies i want governments everyone to invest in my company i want i want money to flow into my company so when will money flow into my company when i show a very attractive picture okay when my financial statements are very attractive for the investors then what will, what do you mean by very attractive the performance is extraordinary my performance has to be better than mahindra on the face of it i'm not saying the actual performance i'm i'm saying my performance should appear should appear better than mahindra only then people will come and invest in my company when will it appear better than mahindra when my profit is more my when my profit is way more than what mahindra is showing so what would i have done what i would have done think about it now one very important rule and this is the rule this is not the this is not an official rule but this is the rule which i tell my students if you want to learn ifrs very well if you want to really thoroughly understand ifrs you have to look at the example of uh, you know the criminal and the police okay the chor police so the thief always tries to stay one step ahead of police but then police also has to think like a thief they need to know how a robber thinks or how a criminal thinks only then they can catch the criminal right so you have to if you want to learn ifrs really well you have to ask yourself what can the companies manipulate okay what can someone with a criminal mindset do to manipulate the financial statements that is one question you need to always ask if you want to really understand ifrs well and i am going to talk about this uh, you know subsequently as well for individual ifrs so you need to ask yourself if there was no guidance someone from tata motors would have said that hey look we want to attract investors right we want to show very attractive profits so let us play with this connection between depreciation and nca nca in my balance sheet and depreciation in my pnl they are connected if i show a higher amount in my nca i will have to charge a higher depreciation and if the depreciation is high my profit will be low all of you agree if my depreciation is high profit will be low so how can i keep my depreciation low there are different ways there are different ways to do that one of the ways is to manipulate the cost of the non current asset so i will include i, I will add the purchase price but i will not add the off try i will not add these wages i will try to push it somewhere else i'll try to maybe add it in the current assets my objective is to show a very attractive profit i my objective is to overstate the profit okay so these wordings are important my objective is to overstate why do i want to overstate the profit so that so that the investors are attracted it's like there is one term in accounting called as window dressing so those who have studied auditing must already be aware of this right window dressing so just like uh, the the dealer the shopkeeper who is selling dresses okay he ensures that 
the best of the dresses are highlighted to the public. So he sets up a very nice lighting system. So anyone who is uh, when you're walking on the footpath, they will immediately see, okay, this is such a nice shirt. This is such a nice dress. They will be attracted to that. They will come inside the shop and maybe they will buy it. But later on, when they take that dress back home, they realize that it's, it's just you know, another normal dress and I have paid so much. So window dressing is a term used in accountancy. It is, it is a term used to, uh, to express manipulation. Okay. So accountants manipulate the books of accounts, especially overstating the profits so that more investments can be attracted. Of course, it, sometimes the objective is also to understate the profit so that lesser taxes are required to be paid to the government. So it depends on the objective, what you want. How do you want to manipulate your profits? If you want to understate your profit so that you need to pay less tax to the government, you can, you can inflate your depreciation. You can bring more and more expenses to the PNL. Okay, or you can charge a particular method of depreciation, which ensures that depreciation amount simply swells up. Guys, are you understanding this? Are you able to understand what I'm saying? Now, SBR is a very matured subject. Okay, it's not only about calculations. You need to have a macro perspective about the entire accounting world. So are you all understanding what I'm saying? So if there was no IFRS, if there was, if there was no accounting regulation, if there was no one to give rules, then companies would have resorted to such practices. And such a practice is called as profit smoothening. What is it called as? Profit smoothening. Profit smoothening is simply playing around with profits and ultimately showing that profit which you want to show, not the actual thing. You're not showing your actual financial statements. So your financial statements are not reliable. When you, when you resort to profit smoothening, your financial statements are not, they are not faithfully representing anything. They are not relevant, nor they are showing any faithful uh, representation. So profit smoothening is manipulating the profits the way you want to. If you want to pay less tax, inflate the expenses. If you want to attract more investors, inflate the profits. So this particular thing can be done within the four walls of the law. You don't have to do anything illegal per se. Okay. You can do profit smoothening by using your normal accounting practices. And hence we need something to stop this, to prevent this. So the biggest job of IFRS is to ensure not only what you said, you know, consistency, comparability, of course it has to be there, but the biggest role of IFRS is to ensure that the financial statement are not manipulated. They do not, uh, you know, serve the inappropriate agendas of the management. And the financial statements are reliable. The financial statements are relevant and the financial statements show a faithful representation of the condition of the business. Guys, are you with me? Have you understood so far? I'll be checking with you frequently, whether you are with me or whether you're not understanding simple so far. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Shruti, yes. All right. Cool. So, one unwritten rule of IFRS. Now, unwritten because you'll not find this anywhere written in any book. But I want you to really take this seriously. I know it's a little funny. But yes, you have to develop a mindset of uh, like a cop. You know, you're a cop, you're a, you're a police. And you also always have to ask yourself how a thief will think. What would be his thought process? What, what will he think of to, you know, to cheat the law? 
So this is one question we'll always for so whatever accounting standard we learn whenever we are going to learn the consolidated financial statements, whether we are learning uh, revenue related leases, you know, a lot of accounting standards we are going to learn for every accounting standard. This would be my first question. Okay, that what is that one thing that can really go wrong? What is that one crime that can take place because of which we have this IFRS? See, every IFRS, every accounting standard has been created to prevent some mischief, mischief by the accountants. Okay, and of course, the next, you know, the tertiary reasons are what you said to ensure that, you know, I can, like as an investor, I would always want the financial statements of Tata and Mahindra to be comparable. So if Tata is very openly disclosing that a particular court case is pending, someone has sued Tata company and Tata is disclosing it. Someone has also sued Mahindra, but Mahindra hasn't disclosed it. Mahindra is very silent about it. The case is going on and very likely Mahindra might lose the case in the court of law, but Mahindra is silent about it. So Tata is disclosing Mahindra is not disclosing the same event. That is a pending court case. The same event, one company is disclosing, another company not disclosing. Again, you know, it would be the financial statements won't be reliable. They would not be representing true and fair view. They would not be relevant. And then if they're not relevant and if they're not uh, faithfully representing the facts, then as an investor, these financial statements are not of much use. I won't be, I would be taking wrong decisions if I rely on such financial statements. And hence we need accounting standards and hence we need IFRS. Okay. So guys, uh, this was just one example that was IS 16. There are many, many more examples and I'm going to talk about them in that respective accounting standard. Okay. Now, Coming back to the syllabus. First, we'll discuss the syllabus. We already know we are, we are now a little bit in touch with what IFRS is. Maybe some of you are able to recall a few things that you have already studied. So now let me discuss the SBR main syllabus areas. The first one is conceptual and regulatory framework. Okay, where we are going to learn not only about the definitions, okay, definitions indeed are very important, but we are not going to learn definitions just for the sake of it, just to memorize them. SBR completely discourages memorization, okay, it does not support memorizer. You can't memorize things and pass SBR. So now we are supposed to apply these definitions in a particular case let, or we are we are supposed to apply it to a particular case study. So I'm going to start it today itself. So we'll see that next. Then comes a very important area of the syllabus. Probably you're learning this, you would be learning this for the first time. And that is the ethical requirements applicable for professional accountants. So right now, as a student, maybe you will not relate with this so much. But then we are going to do some role plays. Okay. We are going to look at some practical case studies and there is something called an accountant's dilemma. What do, what do you mean by accountant's dilemma? Like if Saksham is my company's accountant and I am the CFO or maybe the managing director. So I instruct my accountant, that is Mr. Saksham to pass certain journal entries which are completely against accounting standards, which are, which are not in line with IFRS at all. But now, uh, Saksham is my employee. I'm, I'm his senior. I'm, I'm the managing director, in fact. So now he, he's in a dilemma. Should he listen to me? Should he listen to his boss? Or should he do something else? Should he ignore my advice and, uh, pass the journal entries or pass the accounting entries as per the IFRS. What should he do? So this is a typical dilemma, which, you know, accountants have to, uh, sometimes go through. Now, again, if there are no ethical guidelines, what will Saksham do? 
Now, if Saksham has his own personal ethics and own personal moral standards very high, then and if he's asked to do something really very serious, which is against you know public interest, then Saksham would resign. He would say, "No, I'm not going to do this. This would be, you know, extremely unethical. I would be taking the public interest for a ride. I would be cheating the government." Big time, so I'm not going to do this. This is one stand he will take. <laughs> or, or if Mr. Saksham is not of such high ethical standards, he might say, "Okay, why should I take put my job at stake? You know, because because that's a real real thing. You know, his job is at real stake. So he will say, "Why should I not listen to my boss? I will listen to my. I'll do what he says." So there should be proper ethical guidelines which we are going to learn. first time in in sbr okay what are those ethical requirements which every professional account professional accountant means those who are members of the acca or any professional body like icai or any you know the country specific professional body every accountant has to uh, is expected that you follow these ethical requirements so we are going to we are going to uh, take a look at what are uh what what is the weightage for this okay we are going to take a look at the question paper pattern very soon but it has got uh, a high amount of weightage okay so this is the second thing that we are going to learn however let me also tell you that okay let me also tell you that we are not going to learn the ethical requirements uh, in the first few sessions okay we are not, we are going to learn them at the end why at the end because in order to know that i am doing something unethical i should know the standards first do you all agree right if i don't know that red signal means i have to stop green signal means i have to move on if i don't know these basic traffic rules there is no question that i should be expected to follow them right if i don't know the standards then how can i be ethical so our, our, our first job would to really study the framework well really study all the accounting standards properly and only then we are in a position to take a stand okay that yes this is ethical and this is not uh, this is unethical do you all agree with me do you all agree unless you have the knowledge of the standards you will not know what is ethical and what is unethical do you all agree just imagine that you don't know the provisions of iis 16 or ifrs 9 you don't know what the provisions are so naturally whatever the cfo and the managing director whatever they tell you you will do it you will do it blindly right you will say okay my boss is telling me so i am doing it right so it is important that we first study the standards properly okay it's important that we learn the accounting standards well so i'm going to keep this topic to be studied at the end, you know towards the end part of our syllabus okay uh has anyone i hope i am audible to everyone ishika okay yeah fine please let me know if you miss out something because i think sometimes because of bad network you might lose touch with the lecture so please let me know okay if you are joining back when you join back let me know okay so the second part of your syllabus ethical requirements very important and then plenty of accounting standards plenty of accounting standards we are going to learn some of them you already are aware of or rather i should say you should have been aware of uh you have studied them in financial reporting paper fr paper but anyways even if you don't recollect them we are going to study whatever is relevant now for uh, sbr so don't worry on that front but plenty of accounting standards some that you should already know and some completely new ones okay that is what we are going to learn very again needless to say very important uh, area of your syllabus then comes probably the most important part the most important because 
it's a compulsory question that you are going to come across. Advanced group financial statements, including group cash flow statements. Now you did not study group financial, uh, group cash flow statements in FR, right? You did not have that in your syllabus. So for the first time, you will be introduced to group cash flow statements. You have, you have studied standalone companies cash flow statements, but for the first time now, you are, uh, you would be introduced to, you would be introduced to the group cash flow statements. Okay. Then current issues. Now this is a, again a very mature topic, mature topic because you need to think like as if you are, you, you are a chartered accountant. Now you are an ACCA already working in the industry. Okay. You are able to have, you know, a macro view about what is happening. So there are certain current issues like management commentary. You should also be now in a situation to criticize the existing standards. Of course, why not? None of the standards are perfect. Even the IASB agrees that, you know, yes, IASB agrees that IFRS are not perfect. We are trying to evolve them, but they are not perfect. So now you should also know what are the loopholes. Okay, what are the hiccups which accountants come across while applying certain standards? So certain criticisms towards certain accounting standards, that is what we are going to learn in current issues. And lastly, you have a topic called integrated reporting. Anyone aware of this topic, integrated reporting by any chance? What is integrated reporting? Okay, let me ask you something. Okay, uh, Shakti says no. Okay, so yes, we are start, we would be studying integrated reporting for the first time now. Although it is more of a theoretical subject, it's a theoretical topic, but very important. And it is the future of financial reporting industry. Now, just to give you a quick idea, if I give you the profit and loss account, okay, there is the income statement and the SOFP, that is the balance sheet of a company and ask you that, are they utilizing the capital properly? Would you be able to answer this, this question by taking a look at their PNL, uh, the SOFP, the cash flow statement. And I'm asking you a very simple question. Is this company utilizing its capital properly? Shakti says, yes, yes. Okay. Very good. Now, based on, now listen to this. Okay. This is very important based on the limited understanding of the term capital that you have right now. Your answer is correct. Okay. Almost all of you are talking about ratio analysis, turnover ratios, you know, which is, which is absolutely correct. Fantastic. But that's a very limited meaning that we have given to the term capital. Now, if I ask you, if I ask all of you, uh, what do you mean by capital? Most of you would say, okay, that that's the money that the funds introduced into the business. That is what we have studied as accountants, right? But my dear students in integrated reporting, we are going to have a very, very broad perspective about the term capital. Now you will have capital in the form of the financial capital, the social capital. Don't you think uh, the networks and the contacts that you have in the industry is your capital? I'm asking even you, all of you, the, the individuals. Okay, you have fantastic network in the industry. You, you know a lot of people, a lot of really, uh, you know, top class people. That those contacts are your capital. You can monetize them whenever you want. So you have something called social capital. Then you have something called manufactured capital. Financial capital, of course, you all know the capital that we see, the equity, debt, etc. That is only a very limited perspective of the capital. There are many other forms of capital and each of these forms are of capital are contributing towards the growth of the company. So don't you think 
the investors should also be told about how these other forms of capitals are being utilized. Don't you think the investors have the right to know that? Yes or no? Now, this is a very matured outlook. Okay, That's why it's a, it's a professional level paper. We are going to slowly expand our vision. So as an investor, I'm not only interested to know the ROCE. Of course, I'm interested to know. I'm interested in, I'm interested to know um, what Shakti says, asset turnover ratio. Of course, I'm interested to know, but I'm also interested in knowing what is the social capital of this, of this company, right? What is the manufactured capital? And there are around six to seven different types of capitals, which a company can really exploit to achieve high shareholders value. So is the company doing fairly good enough? on those fronts, I have the right as an investor to know that as well. Do you all agree? Are you understanding these things? Yes, yes. So my dear students, as a new age investor, I'm not only interested in knowing the PNL, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement, but I'm also interested in knowing how this particular company that I want to invest into, how is it doing? Is it doing good? Is it not doing good on these fronts, the social capital front, the manufactured capital front and so on. I'm not going to tell you all the names today because it will be too overwhelming, but you need to know that there are certain other forms of capital which should be reported along with your regular reports along with your PNL balance sheet cash flow statement. Along with these other reports also need to be integrated. Only then the investor will have a complete perspective. So guys, this is, uh, this is the modern approach towards accounting. And this is going to be the future. Okay, uh, integrated reporting is being studied for the last, I guess, only two, two years, or maybe less. Industry is slowly you know, it would be slowly implementing integrated reporting. Right now, I, I hardly know any companies. I think only three or four companies in India follow integrated reporting. Okay, most of them are listed. Okay, only listed companies are interested in integrated reporting. So there is a huge scope of integrated reporting coming into the mainstream accountants. Okay, it would be a part of the mainstream financial reporting very soon. So this is futuristic thing. This is a futuristic aspect that you're going to learn in your syllabus. So now guys, what are those accounting standards that we are going to learn? Please don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel scared. These are just, this is just a list of standards, but I promise you each one of these standard is very, very, very easy. Do not worry at all. Okay. So, the accounting standards that we are going to learn, 13, fair values, business combinations, which we have already studied a little bit in financial reporting. Then CFS, again, IFR is 10, some part we have already studied in FR. Joint arrangements, we are going to learn for the first time, IFR is 11, foreign currency, we have studied a little bit in FR. Now we are going to learn more in detail in SBR. Non-current assets, you are already aware, but again, now the perspectives will change. The questions would be a little different. Intangible assets, we have studied impairment of assets. Okay. But we are not going to learn these standards again, what we have studied in FR. Okay. Those things will be definitely be, uh, we are go definitely going to apply them and we are going to discuss them as well. Don't worry. But now application part will be more important. Discussion part will be more important. Okay. Then we have IFRS 5. Again, we have studied this in FR, the basic principles we have studied. Non-current assets, this is also called as HFS, held for sale, discontinued operations. Employee benefits, share-based payments, completely new accounting standards. IS 19, IFRS 2. We are going to start from scratch. Okay. Financial instruments, IS 32, IFRS 7, IFRS 9. We have studied the basics in FR. Now we are going to build up on that knowledge. Operating segments, IFRS 8, completely, totally new standard. 
then revenue from contracts from customers and leases we have studied it a part of it at least 50% part we have studied in fr and now we are going to uh, use that knowledge and apply it in sbr inventory is one of the easiest standards is2 deferred taxes is12 we have some we had some part of it in fr but now we are going to take it further then ifrs1 first time adoption of ifr something interesting so those companies who are now migrating from the old standards to ifrs what are those uh, what are the requirements so that this transition this, this transition is very smooth to ensure that this transition is smooth and error free there is a separate standard for it that is ifrs1 so we are going to learn the rules for uh, for the transition requirements then is37 provisions contingent assets and contingent liabilities we have already studied uh, a part of it in fr event after uh, events occurring after the reporting date is10 we have studied it in fr is8 again we have studied it in fr accounting policies changes in accounting estimates and errors related parties completely new standard is24 i think some part of that you had in fr yes a very only the definitions you had in uh, in financial reporting but now we are going to build up on uh, those definitions and really apply it into the case study is33 we had in fr now we are going to learn the advanced issues interim financial statements we are going to learn for the first time is34 so my dear students these are the accounting standards per se that we are going to learn okay please understand that each of these accounting standards uh each of each of these have been set on the conceptual framework that means it's better to fully understand the conceptual and the regulatory framework first before we move on to the accounting standards okay and of course as you can see advanced group financial statements and group cash flow statements itself is an accounting standard so uh, so the applicable standards here are ifrs 3 uh, specially related to goodwill and ifrs 10 which uh, exclusively talks about um the 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 consolidation of the financial statement the group financial statements all right so how would your exam paper look like so we have only two sections section a and section b we don't have multiple choice questions now so in section a we have we would be having two questions now the format has changed a bit few years back i think up to 2018 or 2019 we had only one big question in section a like we have for afm right in afm we have one question for 50 marks with multiple requirements of course so that format was there in sbr as well but now they have changed it thankfully it has becoming it, it has become more uh, you know i would not say easier but simpler okay it has become more student friendly so now you will have two questions one is a 30 marker question which would be about group financial statements the consolidated financial statements maximum marks would be 30 but within these 30 marks i have always found out that they ask around 5 to 7 marks sometimes even 10 okay so i will say ranging between 5 to 10 marks are dedicated for uh discussions you need to discuss what you have done in the consolidated financial statements above so first you prepare the consolidated financial statements and then you have to depending on the requirement you have to discuss those numbers okay kind of report writing that you have seen in afm okay those students who have studied for afm they are aware of what is report writing so kind of 5 uh, to 10 marks are dedicated towards discussing the numbers okay but at least 5 marks minimum 5 marks would be for uh, it's called as a discursive element so we'll be discussing and explaining the numbers the second question as i said would be about they will give you a, a long case study where you have to pick up the ethical dilemmas of the account okay quite interesting you will really like uh, these case studies 
okay because they are like you know real life stuff you will be facing these kind of issues when whenever you work as a public accountant so you have to pick up the ethical issues and suggest how can you handle these dilemmas okay now out of 20 marks two marks would be for your presentation uh it would uh, it would include presentation your structuring of the answer the titles they are called as professional marks okay so collectively it would be for 50 marks 30 plus 20 50 marks would be your section a now in ethical issues again there would be almost no number crunching no calculations almost time same here and there you might require to do some kind of ratio analysis or some quick calculations but majority part of it would be writing a kind of a, a report okay so writing skills would be very important to pass the sbr paper exactly like for any other professional paper uh, some of you have attempted afm so you know you understand how much important are those uh, are those writing skills so that would help you in question number 2 as well so that is your section a 50 marks section b you will have two case studies so again two questions to different case studies and they can pick up any accounting standard uh, mostly they will not pick up from of course uh, the group financial statements nothing from consolidated financials but apart from that you know acc has so many options so many standards they can ask you from any standard any part of the syllabus can be tested and again it would be for 50 marks 25 marks per case study and i believe at least out of these 50 marks at least 20 to 25 marks are discursive elements where you have to discuss explain uh, give your opinion then you have to also uh, sometimes criticize criti critical evaluation depending on the verb that uh, the particular requirement carries so guys this is and again you have two professional marks in section b so collectively uh, you have four professional marks in your paper which is going to change very soon by the way so maybe in the september exams you will have uh probably for 20 marks your professional uh, your professional marks would be 20 marks okay but let's see let's not talk about talk about it right now so right now you have only four marks dedicated to uh towards the towards the professional marks so guys are you with me so far are you understanding everything whatever we have discussed any questions please feel free to ask okay uh saksham i'll answer that that is the next thing i'm going to handle but anything you want to ask based on what we have discussed so far no sir okay ishika no sir shikha yes anything you want to ask nothing okay now what are we going to use in our sessions so as far as i am concerned and as far as what i have understood about this exam and based on my experience the best thing that can help us is the study text which i have if you check uh, the links i have shared with you you will find it we are going to follow the study text of course i am going to share some notes with you but you know i will always like to write the notes at the end i'll tell you why now i don't know uh, what is the trend in in other training institutes or what other trainers do but what student uh, believe is that there are some magical notes 
okay in this world there is some holy grail so if they come across that holy grail those notes they can magically pass or they will magically understand the accounting standards i wish it was like that to some extent yes to some extent that is true your your understanding can be improvised with good quality notes of course i'm going to help you with that but i will give it the least importance so i hope you are understanding what i'm trying to say okay i'm not someone who can who would really encourage shortcuts especially for ifrs paper okay because this is a career oriented subject it is not something that you study in your graduation and then later on forget about it no this is a professional paper your next 20 25 30 35 40 years of professional life your working life may depend on this knowledge your interviews might be depending on this knowledge so i generally don't recommend taking shortcuts but yes we are going to use some notes which i am going to share with you okay but predominantly we are going to use the content in the study text number 2 the exam kit because it is not enough only to solve uh, illustrations from the study text that much is not enough that will give you an understanding of the concept but what will help you pass the exam you know what will help you pass the exam learning how to apply that's it that's the secret if you don't know how to apply no matter how much knowledge you have i didn't i don't think so it is uh, it's possible to clear sbr or rather any professional paper okay so exam kit solving uh, questions from the exam kit are going to help us towards that we are going to learn we are going to apply sorry we are not going to learn we are going to apply whatever we learn from the study text and from the notes okay the third thing i have also shared with you something called as uh, can anyone tell me have you gone through the link let me check i am continuously talking for the last i think one and half hour or one hour let me ask you guys have you checked the link which i have shared with you yes, what is sir. The, what what is that thing that you have come across that i have shared pocket notes pocket notes yes very important but please do not reverse the order <laughs> many a times i know you guys won't do that but sometimes you know students are always tempted to reverse this order they start from notes then the pocket notes and then at the end the study text okay uh, well sometimes students make it everyone has a different approach but most of the time students don't understand what they are what they do and their marks are uh, they don't get the pass mark okay so please do not reverse this order we have to start with the text applied in the exam kit and pocket notes and notes are for our lectures so during our sessions of course i am going to use study text a lot i am going to use study text during our lectures as as well but principally we are going to take help of these two things or maybe sometimes i'll tell you to read a few pages from the pocket notes as a home assignment okay so read this page number 25 page number 27 and get back to me so these kind of assignments i may give you just for you know revising a few concepts okay and i would be using spreadsheet to solve questions as you can see on your screen then of course i'll be using this journal okay i'll be using spreadsheets i'll be using windows journal some of the pages from this journal i'll be sharing with you which i believe you know sometimes i write something i explain something in the moment okay i give some practical example then uh, that practical example will be captured in the video but sometimes i do write something on this journal so i'll make a copy of it if i think it's important to be shared uh, then i'll share it with you uh, in the drive okay and of course we are going to use these notes okay i also uploaded the first topic the first chapter 
But as I said, these are the notes, the fourth priority. The priority comes at the fourth, but I'm going to use them during our sessions to discuss a few points. Okay. And uh, technical articles I'll be sharing with you. Technical articles are, of course, they're important. Why not? But again, you know, not right now. We are just beginning. Technical articles are something that we'll be discussing once you are, once you have the knowledge, once you know the syllabus, then it makes sense to go to the technical articles. However, I won't stop you from reading them straight away. Okay. You can start reading it from today itself. You can visit the ACCA website, go to the SBR section, and you will find the technical articles. The top 10, top 10 technical articles are what we are going to target. Okay, these are the important ones starting from the top. Okay, uh, chronologically, the first 10 articles, the latest being the most important. You can start reading them straight away. Whether you understand, whether you don't understand, doesn't matter, but at least you'll get a hang of how the articles have been written and what they are trying to say. Okay, and some of them, of course, even I am going to discuss. So, guys, clear with the methodology that we are going to follow? Everyone. Okay. So we are also going to dis discuss uh, about the days and the timings, but that we'll discuss towards the end of the session today. We are having our session till 9.30. So it will be a three hour session, uh, thrice a week. Okay. In the evenings, but we'll discuss about this later on. Okay. Of course, we are going to have breaks in between. Please feel free to tell me if you need a break. Okay. Breaks would be important, especially for a paper like SBR breaks are important. Uh, my plan is to give one break of around five to seven minutes in between after one and a half hour. But if you want some quick bio breaks or something like that, a two minute break or something like that, please feel free to let me know. Okay. There is no point in sitting uh, completely defocused. Okay. Just sitting for the sake of it. Okay. It's of no use. So if you want some distraction, if you want to just go out and come back again, um, just a two minute, three minute break, please let me know. Okay. So guys, can we start? So this was just an overview about the things that are going to come up. Can we start now with the first topic? I'll take you to the study text. So you have around 20, four topics, 23 topics. You can completely ignore 24 because I hope you know there are two variants of SBR. One is the INT variant, the international variant, and one is the UK variant. We are learning right now for the INT. All of us give INT, not the UK one. So you can completely ignore chapter number 24. Then 25, 26, 27, again, they are not... Uh, part of your syllabus. There are questions and answers and some additional information given to you. So basically we are supposed to focus on the first 23 topics. Okay. And of course, uh, as you guys told me, some of you had long breaks, two year break, one year break, something like that. So we are definitely going to start with the frameworks. I'm not going to start with an accounting standard straight away. I'm going to talk about frameworks, definitions, and uh, please believe me, these frameworks will help you to understand the syllabus properly in its entirety. Okay. Because as I said, framework is like a foundation. On this foundation, this entire uh, structure of accounting standards stand. So we are going to focus 
we are going to give some time to frameworks, understanding definitions. I'm going to give you a lot of examples. And as I said, I'm not going to take chapter number two right now. I'm going to take it later on. So after chapter one, we are going to go to chapter three. Okay, that is performance reporting where we are going to handle some basic accounting standards like IAS 1. So IAS 1 is the foundational accounting standard. There is no equivalent to IAS 1 in Indian GAAP. Okay, of course, we have something called AS 1, Disclosure of Accounting Policies. But in India, IAS 1, can anyone tell me, I told you this right at the beginning. Do you Are you able to recall? Can you tell me what is the equivalent of IAS 1? In India, IS1 basically talks about the formats. How will the PNL look like? How would the balance sheet look like? What are the components? What are the structure? How, how would the structure look like? So in India, what is the corresponding equivalent? Do you have such standard uh, in Indian accounting standard? I told you right at the beginning. What did I talk about? Let me check if you were alert. So in India, we don't have IAS 1, but we have something equivalent. What was that? Now this will give me an idea who was listening very attentively. Saksham, Ishika, Shakti. IAS 1. So similar to division two, schedule three. Very good. Who gave me the answer? Who is it? Sir Shruti. Shruti. Very good, Shruti. Very good. So, in India, we don't have an equivalent standard like IS1 because it is taken care of by the Companies Act itself. In Companies Act, we have something called Schedule 3. Within Schedule 3, we have two divisions, Division 1, Division 2. So within Division 2, you will find similar provisions as given in IS 1. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, although it's not a part of your syllabus, okay, Indian accounting standards are not part of your syllabus. But it is always good to know as a part of, you know, if I'm, in, I'm a part of an interview panel and if you have come for some financial reporting uh, job profile, then I would definitely ask you about something some very simple stuff like IS1. And then what do you think about IS1 in the Indian context? Okay, do we have IS1? Most of these accounting standards we have in, in the AS as well. Okay, we have in, in Indian gap as well. But IS1 is missing. It is missing because the company law takes care of it. So within the company law, we have the formats. So if you ask any Indian accountant, if you ask him about the format of the balance sheet, you know, what will he refer? He will not refer IS1. He will refer division two of the company law of the Companies Act. Okay, guys, I hope you're understanding this. I'm just sensing, you know, since this is our first lecture, I'm just trying to know whether you are in sync with what I'm sharing with you. Okay, sometimes I would be giving you some extra knowledge, which is relevant. Yes, yes. Okay. So I'm going to start with the framework, then the performance reporting, and then we are going to build up on some accounting standards. I'm not going to take you directly to the group financial statements. Group financial statements are chapter number 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay. These four topics, very, very important, probably the most important in your syllabus, but we are not going to start with that. Okay. We need to have a good understanding of some other accounting standards first. And towards the end, once we are done with 70, 80% of the syllabus, we are going to go to chapter number two, which is mostly theoretical in nature. So what are we going to learn in frameworks? I'll take you, I'll share these notes with you. First and the foremost, we spoke so much about IFRS, okay? But which is that entity, which is that body that issues IFRS? And why should we listen to it? 
a company in india why should a company in india follow ifrs at all so these are some basic questions that you need to understand okay so my dear students please understand that there are around 195 countries in this world maybe more than that little bit more 197 198 but 195 plus countries in this world out of these 195 countries around 180 countries around 180 countries each of these countries have their own individual accountancy body which regulates the accountancy profession in that respective country like in india we have the institute of chartered accountants of india okay so icai institute of chartered accountants of india has been this body has been created under an act of the parliament okay so this is the central professional body which regulates accountancy profession in india similarly we have such accountancy bodies in each of these 180 countries all of these accountancy bodies okay or majority of them at least are part of something called ifac international federation of accountants now it is not important right now to know the full forms okay because that is something that we can mug up later on but we need to know the purpose of these bodies so international federation of accountants is an international it's a global body and who are the members of ifac these respective individual accountancy bodies of these 180 countries okay and ifac conducts meetings of the representatives of these accountancy bodies okay they every year they meet it's not important how often they meet and, and all that stuff but they meet to improvise the accountancy profession what is the main purpose of ifac to ensure that accountancy profession rises itself it raises itself to meet the challenges of the modern world the modern day business transactions and thereby improvising the accountancy profession that is the main purpose of ifac so each of the accountancy bodies of these 180 countries is a member of ifac and they have collectively agreed to follow the accounting standards created by another body called as iasb international accounting standards board which is set up in london so please do not misunderstand do not be under a false impression that iasb is the professional body of uk no in uk we have some more uh, you know different accountancy bodies like in india we have icai in uk we have some other bodies iasb has been set up in london that is their head office headquarters so it's the international accounting standards uh, board that issues ifrs okay now again you must have studied in financial reporting now if i'm not discussing something from fr then understand that it is not important and hence i am not discussing i am not going too much in depth because it is not relevant right now but just to give you a brief idea within iasb we have different sub bodies i hope you remember any one of you remember that within iasb now on top of iasb we have something called as ifrs foundation ifrs foundation overlooks how isb is doing its job so it has around 22 members they are called as trustees they represent these 180 countries 
Now you might be wondering how can 22 people represent 180 countries because because these 22 people they represent cluster of countries segments so Asia or Africa or Middle East something like that. Okay, so 22 people okay who are appointed as trustees they go on changing they are not constant these these people are uh, sometimes reappointed sometimes. uh they have to vacate the office but these are the 22 people who overlook who who are there to see how whether iisb is working as per the agenda and what is the agenda of iisb to issue top class accounting standards to be followed across the industries in the world yes so i was asking you is anyone aware of some other sub bodies of iisb the overlooking body we have already uh, seen ifrs foundation 22 trustees okay is anyone going to ask you these things in sbr no but these are the basics which were given in fr little bit of that we are revising okay any other uh, bodies that you are aware of uh, sub bodies you can call them departments or whatever okay but these are these are constituted constituted along with iasb Shruti, Saksham, Ishika. No one. Shakti. Okay, do you guys remember or not? At least tell me that. If no, you can type no. This silence is very scary. <laughs> okay, it's okay if you don't remember. That's perfectly okay. Okay, that's perfectly okay. As it is, no one is going to ask you in SBR, but it is good to know. So IFRS Foundation overlooks whether IASB, who has been given the task of preparing. high quality accounting standards whether they are doing their job properly or not okay that the job of ifr is foundation now let us say isb comes with a very nice accounting standard is 16 property plant and equipment okay very well drafted covered all the possible issues that may come up while accounting for ppe but later on when applying this standard in the industry the accountants are finding it difficult to interpret for a particular situation because real world is not so easy right it's 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 one thing to write very good accounting standards in books but later on when you set out your business in the real world some very complicated transactions come in cryptocurrencies have come in now digital assets have come in now so many complications are there now how to apply a particular accounting standard in a particular situation so isb will not come and interfere the industry can contact a body called as ifrs interpretation committee ic so you can question you can send across your question to the interpretation committee the interpretation committee again comprises of accountants and experts economists okay people who understand the business world and the accounting world they try to resolve this issue they try to come up with their interpretation they offer their interpretation and then the industry can decide whether to uh, follow it or not mostly it is followed okay guys uh, are you able to recollect uh, kisi ko ye yaad aaya there is something called interpretation committee so we have the main we have the iisb we have the overlooking body ifrs foundation we have the interpretation committee okay so these are these this, this collectively this this entire mechanism collectively ensures that the ifrs is followed and implemented across the world interpretation committee they are doing its job of interpretation then there are there is something called advisory council 
Okay, I'm not going to scare you with these uh, fancy words. Okay, but just just naming them. Advisory council. These are the people who advise the IASB. They advise them. Okay, these are our inputs. We feel that this should this should be the provision in this particular accounting standard. These are the people who are in touch with the industry. They know what are the problem areas which the industry is currently facing or investors are currently facing. Like example, best example I give these days is cryptocurrencies. So none of the accounting standard so far talks about cryptocurrency. None of these talk about uh, bitcoins. None of these talk about digital assets, NFTs. None of these account because these are extremely new things. These new things, these new way of transacting uh, has not been uh, envisaged by the ISB so far. So advisory council would come and tell the ISB that, hey, look, we need to think about this now. We need to come up with, you know, some accounting standard. So this was just, a, uh, you know, just uh, an understanding of how ISB along with all these supporting institutions how they ensure that the IFRS is prepared, uh, IFRS is, uh, you know, brought in and how it is implemented. Okay, that's it. This is the, these are the only things you need to know. Okay, so ISB framework, they have come up with a framework. Now, what has ISB done? ISB has something called framework. Now try to understand the context of the, the term framework. It's like the four pillars of the wall, right? Whatever your accounting policies, your accounting estimates, whatever they are, they should not fall beyond these limits. So framework kind of gives the boundaries beyond which we cannot go. So one of the biggest difference between IFRS and let us say US accounting standard, the American gap is called as American gap. What is gap? Generally accepted accounting principles, nothing but accounting standards. Just like we have IFRS for the rest of the world, US have their own way of doing things. Okay, US companies do not follow IFRS, they have their own gap. So one of the biggest difference between IFRS and US gap is that IFRS gives us a framework within which you can create rules for yourself. So IFRS is less rigid, it's flexible. You have different choices, different ways of accounting for transactions. In US GAAP, it is, you know, it's highly, highly rule based. Will you believe that in US we have uh, 150 plus accounting standards? 150 plus. And in IFRS, we hardly you know how many IFRSs are there? Are not more than collectively IAS and IFRS, not more than 40. Okay, 40, 41. Right? But in US, the accounting standards number go beyond 150 because every issue they have a standard. So it's fully rule based. The auditors and the accountants do not have to apply judgments at all. Every transaction has been captured into their accounting standard. And hence it is very rigid. US gap is very rigid. They don't have something called framework. I'll give you, I'll give you one analogy. Okay. So if I tell Ish, uh, Shruti, okay. Or uh, Ishika or now Divya also is joining. Okay. So if I tell you that if, if your parents tell you that, uh, see, if you want to go out, to meet your friends, you can go out, but ensure that you come back home by max 10 p.m. Okay. You can do whatever you want. You can, you can study, you can party, you can hang around, but 
ensure that you come back by 10 pm this is called as a framework right i hope you are understanding this this is the framework but if i tell you if if your parents tell you that by 7 pm you need to come have your dinner go back by 8 pm you have to start studying 8 to 9 8 to 9 you have to study 9 to 9:30 you can watch a television serial or you can do some something you know your regular stuff on facebook instagram by 9:30 you are again going to come and study at 10 you can have some snack at 10:15 so this this is called as rule based this is this is called as rule based approach what do you mean by framework or what is what do you mean by principle based approach in principle based approach nobody tells you what to do what not to do but they give you they give you broad you know the boundaries so ifrs gives you boundaries of course there are certain rules in certain cases but within those rules also you have choices but in us gap very few choices you have rule for each and everything so very rigid and hence whenever things are not rigid framework has to be there so your parent will tell you come home by 10 pm this is the framework you can't go beyond it you have to start you need to study at least for 2 hours every day framework they are not telling you what to study what not to study okay so they give you a broad framework within that framework you can decide whether you want to study for fr whether you want to study for sbr or whatever you want to do you can do. but study for 2 hours that's it so guys are you understanding based on these metaphors that i'm giving you the difference between principle based approach or framework based approach and rule based approach are you able to understand this and it's important to understand if you have any questions please do ask we'll take a break in another 2 minutes so always remember this metaphor this this example that i gave you from your life okay if your parents are very strict they tell you what to do in every half an hour these are the things you have to do so that is rule based approach sometimes good but most of the times doesn't serve the purpose like for example if i say uh, ishika if your parents tell you you have to study every day at 6 pm to 8 pm you have to study uh, financial management you have to study within financial management you have to study working capital management now one good thing about this is ishika doesn't need to bother about her time table she has been clearly told she doesn't have to apply her mind she just have to oblige she just have to follow the rule but the trouble is she might lose the substance of the whole thing and she might be just sitting in front of the book pretending to study but doing nothing okay so just to meet the form the substance is lost so this is and that's why it is said that ifrs gives more importance to substance so if your parents tell you that uh, no matter when you want to study you can study in the evening at the night in the, the day in the morning when whenever you want to study you study but ensure that you study 2 hours every day whatever topic you want to study from your syllabus study it for 2 hours now this will give a flexibility to ishika although now she will have to decide what to study and she has to apply a lot of her mind but then she will there is a there, there is a incentive to focus more on the substance not on the form she will focus on what she wants to really study or if she is not in a mood to study in the day she will study in the afternoon not in the morning then in the afternoon okay so principally she is following everything so this is how ifrs is okay so ifrs and hence we need a framework we don't need rules for ifrs we need framework okay so guys we'll take a quick 5 to 7 minutes break after the break we are going to go more in depth into the characteristics of financial statements so as we said we need a framework so ifrs is very clear what your financial statement should portray these are the quality these are the minimum qualities your financial statement should have 
then you can decide you can figure out how to uh, how to bring about those qualities but these are the qualities your financial statement should always possess okay so that is what we are going to learn next so guys can we go for a quick break around 7 minutes yeah sounds good yes sir yes sir okay uh, sir shakti is asking why only 180 countries have standards and not the others yeah uh, well these uh, other countries which don't have standards or which don't have their own accounting standards they they have some broad guidelines given by their governments and basically these are very these are uh, what third world fourth world countries okay some of them are in africa or you know so their uh, economy is so primitive that they don't need uh, well defined high quality standards at all but most you know 180 countries they already have their own standards because they are transacting to that extent okay but the rest countries which are not part of this whole thing it's very very underdeveloped very very poor countries okay where there are there is no development at all so they have other things to take care of not the <laughs> accounting standards okay that is the reason okay guys see you in another 7 minutes
Okay, guys, can we resume? Are yes, we all sir. back? Okay. All of you? Yes. Shruti is already there. Yes, sir. All right. Now, why do we need a framework? As we have seen, just before the break, I give you a, I gave you a analogy. Okay, analogy of what are rules, what are frameworks, how do rules behave, how do frameworks behave? So frameworks are like boundaries. So the first purpose of framework is any accounting standard that will be created, that will be prepared. Okay, because accounting standards are dynamic, right? More and more accounting standards are being added up. So they should be developed within a framework. So if, if your parents tell you that you need to come back home by 10 PM. So whatever schedule you make for yourself, your parents won't interfere in that. You can make whatever schedule you want. Okay. But that schedule should fit the framework. That schedule should not extend beyond 10 PM. So the first job of the conceptual framework is to give the boundaries to the accounting standard that whatever accounting standards will be created, they will be created within these standards. Okay. Now, one very important thing, has it ever happened in your life that your parents must have told you that, uh, you know, the same exam that uh, ensure that you reach back home by 10 PM. You do whatever you want to do in uh, within that, but you need to come back home by 10 p.m. Have you ever extended it? Have you ever gone in some cases, minor cases, once in a year? Have you reached home by 10 30 p.m.? Just an example, say you can you can check for yourself, whatever the time limits <laughs> you have. But have you gone overboard sometimes? Yes. Each one of us go a little bit overboard. Okay. <laughs> Shakti says always. And that's why Shakti, <laughs> you, you need US gap. Okay. US gap has been prepared specially for, for you. Okay. So people who do not follow the framework at all. For them, you have rules. Okay. Anyways. So, once in a while, in some standards, you will see a conflict. Okay. Now guys, I'm discussing something very important. Okay. Which will help you to write good quality answers. Once in a while, in some standards, there will be a conflict, conflict between what conflict between what the standard and the framework framework says 10 PM. You need to reach back home by 10 PM you go a little overboard and you come back home by 10 30. This is what will happen with some, with few standards. Like classic example, IFRS 9, IAS 37. Okay. Now please don't be scared. Okay. I'm just taking these numbers so that later on when we study these standards, you can relate with what I'm saying right now. So in IFRS 9 financial instruments in IS 37 uh, provisions, contingencies, etc. Sometimes we will come across a few things which are a little bit against the conceptual framework. You can instantly point it out. Okay, that conceptual framework says something else, but this particular provision this particular rule in, in this particular accounting standard says exactly the opposite. So yes, contradictions and conflicts do exist between the accounting standard and the framework. So always remember this 10 PM rule. So sometimes you will come home by 10 30. Sometimes it should not be a regular thing. Sometimes. So now, whenever there is a conflict between an accounting standard 
and a conceptual framework, which is a rare thing. But if it happens, what should you do? Any guesses? Whom should you listen to? Whom should you listen to? If you come back home by 10.30 and your parents see that, that you have violated that rule, you have violated the framework. We had told you come back by 10 p.m., but you have come back by 10.30. What will the framework do? What will your parents do? Come on, I'm giving you real life, you know. I'm trying to make this subject a little bit more interesting. Oh, come on, Saksham. They won't punish you. You're not a kid now. Okay, warning. Okay, that sounds better. Oh, come on, guys. Come on, things. So probably ask for the reason. Very good. Very good. Very good. This is what I want you to think about. Simple things. They will not immediately come with a danda and hit you, right? You are not kids any, any longer. Although we would like to believe, but we are not. Okay. So they will come and ask you first. That why are you late? Then you have some genuine reason, right? Oh, someone met with an accident. So we had to go and help him out. Or, you know, I had flat tires, so I had to go and repair it and whatever. Assuming that you are giving genuine reasons. So, whenever there is a conflict between the framework and the standard, listen to the standard. Ignore the framework. So, your parents, they trust you. They say, okay, there was a genuine reason because of which you could not make it in time. So, okay, we are listening to you. We will follow what you say. No problem. Guys, I hope you're understanding. So if there is a conflict between any standard and the framework, listen to the standard. Go with what the standard says. Ignore the framework. Because the very, you know, the situation was such that we could not follow the framework. The framework had to be overlooked. And you had to do something else. So this is the brilliance of IFRS, which is unfortunately, or I don't know whether I should say fortunately or unfortunately, but it is absent in US GAAP. US GAAP is very strict. Very, very strict. It will punish what Shakti says, you know, or Saksham says. It will come and punish. There are very severe punishments for accountants in US, just for your information. Many of the accountants go to jail. They are that strict. Okay, but IFRS is not. So IFRS is more, and that's why it is more popular. That's why so many countries are, you know, okay with following IFRS. Okay, this is one thing. Now, why am I discussing these things in so detail? Because you will face case studies where you will have to apply this simple thing. We have not even started with accounting standard. We are just looking at this first statement, but there might be a case study in the exam where you will see some conflict, the framework says something else. Framework has defined asset in, in some other way, whereas IFRS 9 or, or IS 37, it wants to apply it in some other way. So you should know what you should go with, whom to support. Guys, I hope so. We are not learning anything theoretical. We are learning something very practical. Okay. Then second, the second role, the second important role of the framework is to provide guidance on areas where there are no existing standards. Example, can you tell me some, can you guess some area where there are no guidance, where, where, where there is no guidance yet with respect to accounting standards? One thing that I can think of is cryptocurrencies. People are still figuring out what what is what are these cryptocurrencies? What is Bitcoin and how do we treat this? Okay, all of us have the basic understanding of what cryptocurrencies are, but how do we account them for? Is this an asset? Is that a liability? Is this a current asset? Is it an NCA? Should we show it as a cash or as an inventory? What is it? So in such cases where there is no guidance, the framework will come and protect us. The third 
aids process to improve existing standards. So existing standards definitely have a scope of improvement because when you apply the accounting standard, that time you understand uh, what are the improvements required, what are the loopholes, and that time again, framework will come and support us. Framework ensures that the financial statements contain information that is useful to the users. See, information is, there is no dearth of information. You can, you can uh, disclose as many things as possible in your financial statements, but it would be just information overload. There is no point in giving unnecessary information to the investors and to the uh, readers of the financial statements. So to keep it precise and to keep it relevant for the users, conceptual framework would come and give a proper guidance to the construction of the accounting standard. And last but not the least, it helps prevent creative accounting. So my dear students, it's really good to be creative, but it's not really good to be creative with your accounting. Okay, so creativity and accounting, they don't go hand in hand. So what is creative accounting? Creative accounting is manipulation of your books of accounts. You know, remember the example that I gave you of uh, the Tata and the Mahindra example that is called as creative accounting. So if I want my profit to be very attractive, okay, I, I will resort to window dressing. I will try to tweak some accounting policies in such a way which will ensure that my profit is very attractive. It is overstated. And investors are basically investors. They are not accountants, right? They will believe what is shown to them. They will, they will blindly say, okay, it's a high profit, so let us invest. So such type of creative accounting practices needs to be actively discouraged. Okay, and that is where the framework comes into picture. So the framework that we are following right now is the March 2018 framework. Now, some basics. I'll not spend too much time on this. Objectives of financial reporting. What are the main objectives? It helps your financial reports like the PNL, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement. They help the stakeholders to take some decisions whether they should hand over the resources. So basically in simpler words, helping people to decide whether to invest or not to invest in a particular company or whether to transact with that company or not to transact. So the decisions made by the users will involve investment decisions, financing decisions, voting or influencing management ex actions, etc. So all these financial reports will help the, the users to decide on these three parameters. The users will be assessing the management's stewardship of the entity alongside its prospects for the future. What do you mean by management's stewardship? What do you mean by stewardship? Steward is a generic word. What do you mean by steward? So if I'm traveling on a ship, I fully trust the captain, right? That he will take me through the sea, through the deep sea, and he will ensure that he will take me to the destination without drowning me. Okay? So that is called a stewardship. So the shareholders, they trust the management that the management will take, uh, you know, decisions. They will take actions which are in good interest of the shareholders. So the financial statements show whether the management has really accomplished this task or not, whether they have really upheld the faith which the shareholders have placed on them. The financial statements is like the mirror. So the users will be assessing this stewardship of the entity along its prospects for the future, whether it is worth staying in this company, staying invested in this company, which will require the following information like economic resources of the entity. So naturally the users would like to know what are the assets, what are the liabilities, that is the claims against the entity, nothing but the liabilities. Changes in the entity's economic resources and claims, that is incomes and expenses, right? Incomes and expenses create changes in the economic resources and claims of the entity. And finally, 
the financial reports help in verifying the efficiency and effectiveness of the management. So these are the four things that I need to know as an investor. What are the economic resources of this company? Assets. What are the claims against this company? Liabilities. Changes in resources and claims, incomes and expenses. And finally, how efficiently and effectively the management has done its stewardship job. Okay, so these are the four reasons why financial reporting is such an important subject. Guys, are you with me so far? Any questions? No? Okay. Now, everyone, if anyone has any question, can please ask. All right. The next part is again extremely important and I would want you guys to, I won't say study it by heart, but I would say read it multiple times so that you automatically memorize these things, these two terms. The foundation, sorry, uh, the framework highlights two very important characteristics which are must, must means must, non-negotiable, absolutely non-negotiable. These two characteristics have to be there in your financial statements. If these two qualities are not present, your financial statements are absolutely useless. You can throw them away. So that's why they are called as fundamental qualitative characteristics. So your financial statements should be relevant and they should ensure faithful representation. So I want you to remember these two words at all times. It will help you to answer the discursive elements very well. What is relevance and what is faithful representation? That also has been very clearly given by the framework. It is the information that makes a difference to the decisions made by users. Relevant information is that which is predictive and confirmatory. Again, these two words you have to be very good at. Your understanding has to be good. Your financial statement should have the capacity of predicting what can happen in future and also giving a clear picture of what can happen or what has happened in the past. So predictive quality and confirmatory quality. And companies must have a policy as to what may or may not be material. All unimportant things must be sidelined. You must simply scrap it out. Only material and important transactions should find their way in the financial statements. And those things should have a predictive value and confirmatory value. If these two things aren't there, your financial statements are of no use to the readers. So whenever your financial statements have the predictive value and the confirmatory value, they are relevant. Okay. Now, I don't want to keep this session theoretical. I will give you some example. Okay. Now, many of these examples you won't find in any book. And that's why you need teachers, right? So I'll give you an example. Let us say, I have a company, X Limited, and I need a particular machine. Let me call it machine A. Now the, the cost of this machine, if I think of purchasing this machine, it is $1 million. All right. Now I don't want to spend my money to buy this machine. So what do I do? I approach uh, Mr. B. Now who is Mr. B? Mr. B owns this machine A, but he doesn't use it himself. He doesn't use this machine himself. He rents it out. 
he rents out which is called as leasing he leases out his machines he owns these machines so he is the legal owner and he leases out these machines to anyone who needs it against lease payments against rent fees so x limited approaches mr b and leases out this machine a x limited brings this machine agrees to pay regular lease rentals to mr b and that machine is put to use price is 1 million okay now naturally x limited will not pay 1 million to mr b because it has not purchased it it has simply rented it out okay and x limited is going to pay some amount some xyz amount to mr b every month as lease rentals let us say the the life of this machine is 20 years and x limited has rented out this machine for 20 years that means the entire life of this asset will be spent in x limited so my dear friends please tell me x limited is not the owner of this machine that's for sure x limited has rented it out so will x limited recognize this asset in its financial statements will it show this machine a under non current assets question mark very practical question no so it should be shown as a lease agreement right to use okay that means you are saying that it should be recognized yes sir yes, you are saying it should be recognized as nca within nca it is shown as right to use asset which is depreciable right to use assets are also depreciated this is what you are saying right yes sir okay anybody else would like to try that Uh, Shruti already is aware of IFRS 16, so she has directly applied it. Applied it, but I am not referring to any IFRS right now. I am referring to simple common sense, and I am trying to explain to you what is the meaning of the term relevance. What do you mean by predictive and confirmatory value? So, should X Limited recognize this machine, although it is not the owner? Owner is Mr. B. so should x limited recognize this machine or b should recognize this machine that is the question if you understand this you will understand relevance concept okay now mr saksham he wants to invest in x limited he wants to invest he is an investor he takes a look at the financial statements of x limited what do you think he will expect should he expect to see this machine in the asset side of the balance sheet answer is of course yes he will expect it right because x limited indeed is using this machine for 20 years that means x limited is an effective owner although it's not a legal owner but effectively x limited is the owner it is going to use across the entire life of the asset all the benefits from that asset would be enjoyed by x limited so naturally if x limited does not recognize this asset yet enjoying the income from that asset the revenue from that asset then the financial statements would lose the predictive value saksham will never come to know that x limited has an asset which can give income for the next 20 years ye pata hi nahi chalega na ek none of the investors will come to know and then the the financial statement will lose its predictive value guys are you understanding this yes or no i want your response to this if you're not understanding anything if if you find it too overwhelming please let me know see i can simplify things for you but beyond the point i cannot simplify because we are studying a professional subject professional level subject but i am doing my best to give you examples and make you understand okay so if x limited 
simply says that no, we are not the owner of this machine, so we will not show this machine. This will go completely against the relevance quality of the financial statements. Now for suction, these financial statements will not be relevant because there is no predictive power now, nor there is any confirmatory power because so far X Limited has earned a lot of revenue by using this machine. Revenue is recognized, but machine is not recognized. That means past also is not fully shown in the financial statements. Relevance quality gone. These financial statements are now of not much relevance. Guys, are you understanding? Ishika, are you understanding? Let me check with you. Yes, sir, I'm understanding. Right? Now, what if this machine is not of $1 million, but of only $100? A small machine. Nuts and bolts. Small, small stuff. Now, now can X Limited say, okay, forget about this. Will not show this $100 machine at all. Is that okay? Will your financial statements be relevant? Yes. Now they will be relevant. Why? Because these $100 as an amount is not material for X Limited. Turnover of X Limited itself is $100 million. For a $100 million company, $100 is nothing negligible. The, the rounding of itself happens in 100,000. So $100 are, are nothing, right? You can ignore it fully. So you have to, you have to also focus on materiality. You should not be very strict with predictive and confirmatory values. You have to be strict, of course, but you also have to check the materiality of that aspect. If you feel that it is immaterial, considering the size of the business, then you can ignore it. Then your financial statements are still relevant. Faithful representation. It must faithfully represent the substance of what it represents and is therefore complete, neutral, and free from error. So guys, whenever the term faithful representation comes, you need to understand, you need to memorize these three words. What are those three words? What do you mean by faithful representation? Number one, the financial statement should be complete. They should be neutral and they should be free from error. Now, guys, you might be wondering that uh, are these basics or are these advanced concepts? Basically, these are basics. Okay, these are FR concepts, but they would now find a place in SBR in a very different way. Now you'll understand when we approach the exam kit, you'll understand. Okay. How it is, how, how are these basic concepts applied in SBR paper? And that's why I'm giving so much time to this, uh, this particular topic. Okay. The framework. So your financial statements have to be complete. Only then I can say that they are faithful. They should be neutral and they should be free from error. Now, what do you mean by complete? What do you mean by complete? Can I get some examples from you? Your financial statements need to be complete. If you show depreciation in your PNL, properly calculated, absolutely, you have followed the standard IS 16, you have followed it. Will it be a complete representation? Answer is no. Why? Because IS 16 also requires you to disclose your accounting policy with respect to depreciation. Have you followed straight line? Have you followed reducing balance? Have you followed sum of digits? What method of depreciation have you followed? What is the useful life estimate? What is the residual value estimate? How have you calculated the cost of the asset? All of these things needs to be disclosed in the notes to accounts. Unless you disclose these things, we will not regard your financial statements as complete. Second, they should be neutral, which means no bias, 
and supported by the exercise of prudence. Okay. Now your financial statements have to be neutral, neutral financial statements. That means there should not should not be any management bias. Management bias. Any example of management bias? What do you mean by management bias? Okay, I'll give you one hint. See guys, even if you are not able to answer, don't worry. Okay, I understand that there has been a lot of gap. Maybe there was a lot of gap or maybe you guys did not study it deeply enough. In either case, you don't have to worry. Okay, because now we are going to see it uh, uh, you know, properly now. Do you remember one provision in IS 16? Okay. Do you remember one provision, one rule in IS 16, which says that if you want to revalue your assets, first of all, tell me, do you remember revaluation of assets? Revaluation model, cost model. Do you remember that? See, some things you have to remember, guys. We are studying SBR. Okay. Great. Or some of you are saying yes. Very good. Now, in IS 16, do you remember that it says that if you want to revalue assets, you have to revalue the entire class of those assets. Entire class. What do you mean by entire class? Like say, for example, I have five machines, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. All of these five machines help me together to manufacture my product X. Okay, so these cluster of five machines, five different machines help me to manufacture a product X. So I cannot do cherry picking. What do you mean by cherry picking? How do we go and pick fruits? If you're, if you're just going and shopping for fruits, you just check it, right? How is this apple? It's a big apple. Then you buy it okay it's, it's a small apple not so it's not smelling nice there's no fragrance so this is called as cherry picking you pick the cherries the ones that you want the rest you discard you cannot do cherry picking in accounting if you decide to revalue machine one you have to revalue all these assets you can't say no i will revalue m1 m3 m5 m2 and m4 no not required you cannot do this. You cannot cherry pick your assets and revalue them. You'll have to revalue entire class of assets. Why? Why? This is the reason. Neutrality. You cannot be biased. If you decide to revalue a machine, entire class of the machine should be revalued. This ensures faithful representation. Otherwise, there will be profit smoothing again. If this framework wasn't there, see, again, I'm going back to what I said earlier. Always ask yourself the question. If this wasn't there, what would have gone wrong? Think like a police. Think like a cop. If this wasn't there, you know, what can happen? What crime can happen? So if this requirement is not there, what would people do? What would accountants do or what would companies do? They would simply cherry pick their assets and revalue them. So those assets whose values are in, have increased in the market, they will revalue those assets and those assets whose, whose values have decreased or if there is an impairment, they will not do anything about it because that will push down the profits, right? And that is what they don't want. They don't want to show losses. They want to show only profits. Guys, I hope you're understanding this. Please let me know. So you can't simply pick up the advantages and ignore the disadvantages. The essence of neutrality is you'll have to accept both. Okay, you'll have to accept both the sides. So if some assets are to be revalued upward and some assets to be revalued downward, you need to do that. You can't simply pick up those assets which are to be upward revalued and those who have lost their value, just ignore them. You can't do that. 
that would ensure that you know your your financial statements are not faithfully represented and finally they should be free from error your financial statements should not have big errors major errors material errors and if there are then there is no faithful representation there measurements uncertainty will impact the level of faith i'm sorry faithful representation please remember this last sentence very important measurement uncertainty will impact the level of faithful representation can you tell me one real life practical example of an asset which is experiencing this huge measurement uncertainty every day and because of which accountants are really confused as to how to show that asset <clears throat> how to recognize that particular thing in the financial statements because there is so much of uncertainty in the measurement that if that item is recognized the financial statements will no longer be faithfully represented can you give me that example today itself i have uttered that word multiple times today itself i have said it multiple times what is that there are there is huge answer there is huge measurement uncertainty that means the values change every day drastically what is that asset it's a crypto crypto absolutely cryptocurrencies people still are not figuring out whether it is illegal or whether it is illegal okay legality itself is a question mark but companies are transacting in in cryptocurrencies right many companies are transacting so this is a big problem if if cryptocurrencies are recognized which they have to but then your financial statements would lose faithful representation if they are not recognized are you understanding the dilemma guys this is something very interesting i'm discussing if you recognize financials if you if you recognize the cryptocurrencies in your books of accounts your books of accounts may lose faithful representation because of measurement uncertainties but if you don't recognize it what would happen if you don't recognize the companies are transacting in cryptocurrencies but you are not recognizing it then what would happen relevance will be lost and both are important relevance and faithful representation both are important if you're not recognizing it that means the company the financial statements has lost its confirmatory value something has happened but you're not bringing it into the books relevance has lost something has happened you are bringing it into the books but the value of that thing is so uncertain the measurement is so uncertain that uh, the financial statements are losing its faithful representation and hence cryptocurrencies is the modern day challenge for accountants okay they have to so even the isb is still figuring out what can be done anyways guys i hope you have understood these relevance and faithful representation all of you cool okay now each of these things that we are learning today believe me you we are going to apply it in case studies so please do not underestimate this topic don't think ki are ye to tha humko fr mein bhi okay such a simple thing these are only definitions no these definitions are very practical now we are going to apply it in real stories now real industry case studies and that's why i'm giving you so many examples all right now these are the fundamental characteristics non negotiable non negotiable means you cannot compromise on these like again you know i like to give metaphors so i'll again go back to you know i understand it's dinner time so i'll again take you to the food example so the pickle that you have or the sweet dish that you have it's it's negotiable right most of the times you if, even if you don't find it you you can't you, you won't say no i'll not have my food today and i'm going to stay hungry because there is no pickle and there is nothing sweet 
they are negotiable. You will say, no, it's okay. It's okay. I will compromise on it today. So enhancing quality characteristics are like those characteristics, which if present, if they are there, they would definitely help in better presentation of your uh, financial statements. But even if they are not there, we cannot say that oh, the financial statements are not relevant or not faithful. Okay, if the basic things you uh, are in place in your in your plate, you can still have a good dinner. So the, the relevance and faithful representation are like those basic things that you eat and you feel satiated, right? But yes, over and above that, if you have some sweet dish, some toppings and some pickles, so these are the qualitative, enhancing qualitative characteristics. So first one is comparability. Second one is verifiability. Third one is timeliness. Fourth one is understandability. Can we say that the financial statements are useless if these qualities are absent? No. We cannot say that they are useless. They are still useful, but not up to the mark. All right. Comparability, I need not discuss. The word itself is suggestive. Verifiability, yes. Each and every transaction should be verifiable with uh, a with backup document. And those who have studied auditing, they are already aware of this term verifiability. So if Saksham has passed any accounting entry in the books, so me as a third person would should be able to come and verify. And I should also reach the same conclusion which Saksham has reached. So two professional accountants should always agree. Not 100% all the time, but at least 99% they should agree over, uh, over uh, what has been done in the financial statements. Only then we can say that the verifiability characteristic is present. If there are too much of debates between two accountants over one item in the financial statement, then we can say that verifiability is missing. Then very important timeliness. Information has to be timely in order to be useful. That doesn't mean that if the financial statements are not timely, they are useless. No, that is not the conclusion you have to draw. But accountants have to ensure that the financial information, the financial statements always need to reach the users within time, within the expected time. And finally, last but not the least, this is again, financial statements should not be so complex that even persons with reasonably good accountancy knowledge are not understanding, right? Your financial statements have to be uh, comprehensive, yet simple enough to be understood by someone who has accountancy knowledge, all right? Now, to achieve these characteristics, the company has to bear some cost. They have to hire some good quality accountants. They have to hire some, or uh, they have to set up some good ERP softwares. But you always need to keep in mind that the benefits should always outweigh the costs. Otherwise, why, why are you doing it? If the benefits are $100 and the cost is $200, then there is no point in following all these characteristics, right? So there should always be a cost constraint uh, that needs to be applied and you need to ensure as an accountant that benefits always outweigh the costs, okay? Now, what you need to remember are these two fundamental quality, qualitative characteristics which you will be required to apply in the case studies. Now, the elements of financial statements. Okay, the last part of the framework. And of course, there are some valuation measurement things that also we are going to complete today. Now, let me ask you guys, something very interesting is coming up and very useful for our exams. They are deceptively very simple, but they are not. They appear to be very easy. Okay, if I ask any student, okay, can you define what is an asset? So the student might feel, okay, he's asking me a very simple question, but the question is not simple, or I should say it is simple, but not easy. So if I ask you, 
can i ask you a question all of you are you ready to take a very interesting question right now yes sure right now all of us are doing some activity is that an economic activity are we doing an economic activity answer is yes i am providing you a certain service you are remunerating me for that so it's an economic activity now think from my perspective okay i'm giving your example okay now think from my perspective if i want to prepare my books of accounts what would be my assets let us talk about only this training okay the training that i am delivering to you right now this is an economic activity okay i am going to receive revenue from this economic activity so i need to have some assets in place so typically if i ask anyone how do you define an asset if i ask anyone who has little bit of knowledge about assets liabilities business etc so that person would say that anything that i use for my business which gives me revenue anything that puts money in my pocket is my asset which is absolutely correct right all of you agree anything anything that puts money in my pocket that gives me cash inflows that gives me revenue that gives me income anything is an asset agreed all of you this is the standard definition <coughs> this is the standard understanding all of you agree no just say something i don't want technical and you know don't get into technical side of the things we are going to see the definitions but generally how do you understand an asset okay this is my asset anything that gives me benefit isn't it so anything that gives me benefit especially economic benefit uh, in the context of accounting okay anything that gives me an economic benefit is my asset right now as i now this is now this is where things are going to get a little funny is it possible for me to take this session is it possible for me to train you if there wasn't this gas called as oxygen circulating in my room is oxygen circulating in my room is it circulating in your room do you have oxygen in your room in my room of course it is there how do i come to know how do i come to know that oxygen is there because i am breathing i am alive right so i very well know that there is something a gas called as oxygen because of which i can breathe and since i can breathe i can work i can talk and i can take this session and i can conduct this economic activity so can i say okay now this is where you have to be very alert can i say that this oxygen that is circulating in my room is my asset can i say that it is my asset because as per the standardized definition anything that helps me to generate revenue is my asset if this oxygen wasn't there it would not have been possible for me to take this session then forget about revenues okay thanks to oxygen of course there are other things like laptops electricity and so gadgets and that i am using they are all my assets but without oxygen i would not have been able to survive and if i am not surviving where is the economic activity so oxygen indeed is my asset true or false this is the question no sir no sir सक्षम है श्रुति ये क्वेश्चन मैंने पहले पूछा था आपको ऑडिट के टाइम पे नो सर आई आस्क यू दिस क्वेश्चन नो ना इज इट अ इज इट एन इंटरेस्टिंग क्वेश्चन वर्थ गिविंग अ थॉट यस सर 
Saksham is saying uh, false. Okay. Saksham, can you change the setting to direct message instead of everyone so that your answers yeah. directly reach me? Yeah. Yes. Ishika, are you there? Yes, sir. Did you like the question? <laughs> yes, sir. Interesting, right? I have said something very straight. People say that anything that, that I use, anything that I use to create money, to generate income, to generate sale is an asset, which is absolutely correct. I'm not saying it's wrong. It is correct. So going by that rule, oxygen has to be my asset. No, this sir. is my contention. Why no? What is the reason? We can't control it, maybe. Yes, we cannot control it. Okay, if I could control it, would it have been my asset? If I could control it. Now, can you think of any business which controls oxygen? And what are the parameters of controlling oxygen? Example, hospitals. Hospitals may you have intensive care units where there are patients who need uh, emergency attention. They need to be supplied with oxygen sometimes artificially. So oxygen is provided to those patients who are seriously ill. And how is that provided through oxygen cylinders? Yes. These oxygen cylinders are indeed assets. Yes. Correct. If you check the balance sheet of the hospitals, you will find inventories of these cylinders. Basically, the, 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 that is oxygen, right? Uh, the, the outer container, the, the outer thing is only a, the cylinder is just a container. So the cylinder is not the asset. The oxygen inside that cylinder is an asset. It's an inventory. So you can check the balance sheet of any hospital which, uh, which uses oxygen for its patients. You will find the inventory of oxygen. Why? Because now it is controlling that oxygen. The cylinder is used to control. Number two, you have purchased that oxygen. Whenever I purchase something, it shows that I'm controlling it. Right now, have I purchased this oxygen and am I circulating it in my room? No. Sure. Yeah. I have not purchased oxygen. Okay. I have a session from 6.30 to 9.30 today. So please send me some oxygen. Is it like that? No. This oxygen is just, you know, flowing on its own course and I'm not doing anything. I'm not even aware that it is there. For the example sake, we are talking about it, but we are not aware what is happening, right? How much oxygen is floating here? We are not aware. So there is no control aspect and I've not purchased it. So guys, this example I have given you to make you understand that it is so important to define what is an asset. Unless and until that particular item meets the definition of asset, the accountant should not record it, no matter how useful it is. Is there anything more useful than oxygen to me right now? I see, my laptop is important. The internet connectivity is important. Students are important. Books are important. Everything is important. But is there anything more important than oxygen right now? No. Oxygen is the number one thing that I need to carry out any activity. But will I show it in the books of accounts? No. Why? Because it does not meet the definition as given in the framework. This is how important the framework is. And my dear students, gradually you'll understand. Now, see, I have given you a very crude example. Okay, very basic, funny example I've given you. But later on, as you mature, you'll understand that it's sometimes it becomes very difficult to decide whether it's an asset or not an asset. Practically, you'll realize when you actually go and work, 
in the industry, there are so complex transactions sometimes. I'm, I'm talking about the industry, okay, not in your exams. Sometimes some transactions are so complicated that it, it even becomes difficult to figure out whether there is an asset or there is, there is not an asset. Okay, and hence we need a framework. And hence we need clearly put out definitions. Guys, are you there with me? Are you understanding it? So what does the definition of asset says? Present economic resource controlled by the entity due to past events. Okay. The earlier definition was something else. I think you guys cleared your FR some one year back, two years back, two years back, the definition was something else. Okay. You remember the definition of asset, which was there earlier. Asset is defined as there, there were no words called economic resource. The definition was something else. There was words like future economic benefits, FEB. So those words are no longer there in the definition. The definition is now very clear. The definition says that if that particular resource is an economic resource, now what is economic resource? Anything that has the potential to give you income. Is it giving you? May not. May not be giving you right now. But does it have the potential to give you? Yes. Are you able to control it? Yes. Does it have the potential to give you uh, benefits today? Yes. So it's a present economic resource. You can control it. And from where did it come? From where did it come into existence? Because of your past decisions. Okay. You have taken some actions in the past. Like best example I can give you, which is little unusual. Because usual definitely usual examples won't make the point clear. So I'm giving you a little unusual example. So I have a patent, say for example, and that patent I have registered with the government. I hope you know, all of you know what are patents. Let us say I have discovered some new, uh, new formula to manufacture medicines. Okay. I've invented one formula to cure, uh, headaches. So I have invented one uh, formula. I can manufacture tablets out of it. So that formula I have patented with the government. So the day I patent it with the government, it becomes my present economic resource, which I'm controlling because now I've registered it with the government. If I'm registering that formula with the government, that means nobody else can manufacture Nobody else can use that formula to manufacture that medicine. And the, the very fact that I have registered it with the government, that event ensures that it is my asset. So that patent is my intangible asset. Of course, there are some more definitions. Now, guys, please understand. Is it enough to follow only one, the, the, this particular definition of the asset to... Uh, to recognize it? The answer is no. You have to see this definition plus the accounting standard specific definition. Like the asset that I'm talking about right now, did you guess which accounting standard I'm talking about? I'm talking about IAS. I'm talking about intangible assets, right? So which accounting standard? 38. Correct. Now, IAS 38 has given some additional conditions. If those additional conditions are also satisfied along with the definition of the asset in the framework, only then I can recognize that particular intangible asset. Otherwise not. So framework plus standard needs to be followed. Okay, going back, if there is a conflict between the standard and the account and the framework, throw away the framework for the time being, follow what is there in the standard to recognize that particular item. Guys, are you there with me? 
Are you understanding these things? See, I'm discussing the definitions with you with so many practical examples. So effectively, you can see only three statements, but there are so many deeper things. So oxygen will not be recognized by me, but it will be recognized by the hospitals. The same thing is the oxygen, but hospital recognizes it. I do not recognize it because it does not fit into my definition of asset. Right? Similarly, intangible assets, goodwill. Is goodwill an intangible asset? Ishika will reply it. Let me check. So, yeah. Is goodwill an asset? Purchase goodwill is an asset. Very good. Why? Uh, because we have <laughs> purchased it and yeah. we are. Perfect. Very good. Perfect. Perfect. My own self-generated goodwill. Can I control it? Now, you might be wondering, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Okay. Like, say for example, I have a business and the name of my company is X Limited. Now, X Limited is very popular. The brand is very popular. My goodwill, my reputation is tremendous. But can I separate my reputation from the business? So if Ishika comes and says, uh, sir, can you lend me your goodwill for a day? I'll come and give it back to you. I will say yes, but for that, you'll have to buy my entire company. So my dear friends, please remember, goodwill cannot be separated from the business. Goodwill and the corresponding business, the activity has to go hand in hand. Hence, self-generated goodwill is not recognized as an asset. You can check any balance sheet in this world, any company. You can check Microsoft balance sheet. You can check Amazon's balance sheet, Netflix ka balance sheet. India, may you can check Infosys, Tata, Birla, Mahindra, Sapka balance sheet, you can check. You will not find self-generated goodwill at all, even though these are highly reputed companies. Why? Because self-generated goodwill does not meet the definition of assets. Mind you, I'm not saying goodwill is not an asset. It is an asset. Of course, my reputation is giving me money. But it cannot be controlled. It cannot be reasonably measured also. It is very difficult to measure my own goodwill. And number three, it cannot be separated. IS 38 says goodwill has to be independent. Uh, intangible asset has to be uh, separable. If you cannot separate it from the business, if it is attached to the business, you cannot recognize it at all. So it doesn't meet the definition of the asset. It doesn't meet the definition of IS 38 intangible assets. So self-generated goodwill will not be an asset at all. But purchased goodwill. Now, when will purchased goodwill come into picture? Only when going concern fails. Going concern assumption fail ka both hai. When does going concern assumption fails? Whenever there are, there is liquidation of the companies, mergers and acquisitions, takeovers. In such scenarios, goodwill comes into picture because in such a scenario, goodwill is valued. There is some valuation done and that goodwill is purchased by giving some extra money. The moment you pay to acquire goodwill, such goodwill meets the definition of assets. Now it is a controlled goodwill. Guys, I hope you're understanding this. Are you getting a glimpse of SBR? So the SBR may, we are going, we are learning the very same things what we have studied in FR. Okay, at least with the extent of 30%. 30%, 35% syllabus is the same. But approach is completely different. Now you have to be very practical. 
So they will come up with a case study where you will be actually up wanting to apply the definition of asset. And you'll have to think twice, thrice to check whether this meets the definition of the asset. Now the, now the examiner won't ask you, okay, define asset. Or there will not be an MCQ. You won't find an MCQ where you have to apply, okay, is this, this an asset? No, you will have a big case study where you will be forced to think whether there is an whether this meets the definition or the criteria of the asset given in the framework. Liabilities, exactly opposite of assets. Liability is not a resource, but it's an obligation, but it's a present obligation. Again, this has a far deeper meaning. It has to be an obligation, but it has to be a present obligation. Now, again, I think we have time around five, 10 minutes. Yes. I hope guys, we can continue for another five to seven minutes. Everyone okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Overload to nahi ho hai na? Please let me know. I hope you're understanding everything. Okay. Let us say I have purchased a building for my business. All right. Life of this building is 10 years. After six years. Okay. Now this is my planning today. After six years, I am going to polish and paint this entire building. When? After six years of use. And I know I'll have to spend around $50,000. I've purchased this building for, let us say, $1 million today. And I have decided to spend $50,000 on polishing and painting after six years. Is this an obligation on me? Is this a, is this an obligation? It's a very uh, sensitive question. Now things are becoming very practical. Is it, is it something that I have to incur no matter what? The answer is no. It is a, is, is it a scheduled Mandatory expense? No. Is it a constructive obligation, a legal obligation that I have to spend $50,000? No. This is my choice. So it does not meet the definition of liability. It's not a present obligation. But if the government has made it compulsory, legally mandatory, that every building after six years needs to be polished and painted. Otherwise we'll cancel the license. <clears throat> now what? Now what? Now, yes, it is my present obligation. I will have to discount this $50,000, find the present value and recognize it as a liability and slowly unwind the discount which we have studied in IS 37, unwinding of discount. Okay. We are going to learn it again in SBR. But are you understanding the difference between the two? So recognition of liability also is not always easy. Okay. You have to see whether the obligation is there, whether it is really a present obligation, whether you would be actually making the payment. Sometimes we have obligations, but we have no intention of making the payment. Now, making a payment has a very, uh, you know, it's a very fancy way of, there's a very fancy expression, transfer an economic resource. Nothing but making a payment. So if you have a present obligation because of some past actions to make a payment in future, then it's your liability. So the definition is very simple, straightforward. Application is little challenging depending on real life scenarios. Guys, please let me know in the chat. Have you understood the definition of assets and liabilities? I know it appears to be a little funny question, but as you know, as you have now understood assets and liabilities, 
the definitions are little practical now. Okay, so we have an entire standard IS 37. Then we have IFRS 9, where we are talking, going to talk about financial liabilities. IS 37 also talks about contingencies, contingent liabilities. So a lot of standards we are going to learn where, where we are going to go deep into more details uh, with terms of liabilities. Equity, again, simple equity is nothing but assets minus liabilities, the residual interest. So your share capital plus all the reserves is your equity. Now, income and expense has a very interesting definition. Anything that increases your assets or decreases your liabilities and income. Don't you think so? If you make a sale, sale will always increase your assets. Your cash will increase or your receivables will increase. Or if you are given some discount by your supplier. So whenever your supplier gives you a discount, the discount received is an income. So reduction in liability also is an income. Similarly, expense, if the if the if there is a reduction in the asset, so cash depletes, receivables are not paid off, bad debts, non-current assets are depreciated, again expense, or if there is an increase in the liability, if your supplier cancels the discount, or if you have to allow discount to your customers, which again increases your liability, again, that will be qualifying as an expense. Okay, easy stuff. So every accounting standard, okay, now we'll conclude. Just give me a minute. The last statement for today. So in tomorrow's session, we'll talk about measurement basis and slowly we're going to increase our speed now. Okay, so today was the first day. So I was very slow just to bring you back on the track. Slowly, slowly, gradually, we're going to uh, upgrade our speed. So the last important thing for today every accounting standard okay mind you every each and every accounting standard that we are going to learn it has four pillars so we can say that every accounting standard stands on four pillars what are those four pillars anyone has any idea so these four items will be there in every accounting standard one recognition And of course, recognition hai to de-recognition. I hope my spelling is correct. De-recognition. Okay. Recognition means when to bring that particular item in your books of accounts, whether to bring or not to bring. And when to remove, when to de-recognize. So recognition means bringing that item in your financial statements. De-recognizing means removing that item from your books, from your financial statements. So every accounting standard lays down rules for recognition and de-recognition. Okay. Second, can anyone guess the other three quickly? Fast, fast, fast. The That's other three. Measurement. Okay. So tomorrow we are going to learn something called measurement basis basis the pronunciation i guess is basis plural of basis so what are the different measurement basis which ifrs suggests so mainly there are two cost uh, i mean the historical cost and the current cost so we need to really understand the difference between historical cost and current cost and there are some variants of current cost within current cost there are some variants that we are going to learn so R, M, then P and D. Any guesses? P and D. P stands presentation. for? Presentation and disclosure. Very good. Presentation and D stands for disclosure. Disclosure. Okay. So presentation disclosure, we have an accounting standard for this. Which one? For presentation disclosure, we have an account, dedicated accounting standard, which we are going to start tomorrow itself. Which one? IES 1. Yes, very good. IES 1. Not IFRS 1, okay? IFRS 1 is a completely different thing. 
which we are going to learn later on. So IS one talks about presentation and the disclosure requirements in general. In general, please understand the difference. Every accounting standard has got its individual presentation and disclosure requirements. Plus there are generic presentation and disclosure requirements for all accounting standards together for all items. So the generic stuff we are going to learn in IS one, which includes formats, formats, components and structure. What are the components of the financial statements? And what is the structure, the format? That is what we are going to learn. Although you had this in FR, but again, it's very relevant in SBR as well. Okay, so guys, let's stop for today. I hope today's session was fruitful. I hope you understood everything. I hope, I hope you are getting a sense of what is coming up now. Okay, so slowly our sessions are going to become more uh, advanced, a little bit more complex. Of course, we are going to simplify them and more practical. Okay, so guys, can we stop for today? Any questions? If not, then I'll pause the recording and then I'll discuss a few things with you. Ishika, Shakti, Saksham, all well? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll stop.